In the race for electric vehicle supremacy, there have been two mortal enemies, startups and legacy auto. On one side, the agile EV-only companies and startups with fresh ideas and the ability to react quickly to the changing landscape. Their leaders are inspirational, their aspirations honorable, and their products so cutting edge that you might get cut. On the other side, Legacy Auto. Chasing the startups with a mixture of fear and incredulity, they too seek to lead the electric vehicle world, sometimes making grand statements that only highlight just how out of touch they are. What they lack in agile development and EV smarts, though, they make up for in financial backing, part sourcing, and massive dealer networks. Their vehicles are often the smarter choice for first-time owners. They offer competency, reliability, and the backing of years of brand recognition. But both approaches have their benefits, and both their failings. So what would happen if an established legacy automaker set its performance division free to become its own entity, rebranded it as an electric vehicle company, and then let it behave like a startup instead of the legacy auto it started as? What if that brand was headquartered in Sweden, home to sensible furniture, sensible food, and sensible cars, but made in the modern tech manufacturing capital of the world, China? And what if it was jointly owned between a brand once known for taking its time to get things right and one of the world's largest automakers? What if the Polestar 2 is the answer? This is the 2022 Polestar 2, built on Volvo's compact modular architecture platform, a platform it shares with the Volvo XC40, Volvo C40, and Lincoln Co. 01, among others. There's a fair bit of Volvo about this car, but we're here to see if Polestar's unique position in the EV marketplace, a startup owned by established automakers, has enabled it to capture the EV startup vibe with less of the risk. Thanks to Polestar Portland, we've got this car for a few days to put it through its paces, check out some of its features, and give you our first drive verdict. This is the long version of this video, so if you want the bite-sized version, follow the link below. And because we want this to be as easy as possible for you to follow, we've put in chapter marks so you can watch the bits you want to and skip the rest. Behind the wheel, you feel fairly well cocooned in, with the centre console coming up pretty high. There's reclaimed wood inserts all throughout the dash. It's an optional extra, which honestly feels amazing to touch. And the seats come in a choice of materials, including cruelty-free vegan leather, or in this case, Nappa leather. The wheel is very much a traditional Volvo design, with some of the switch gear coming straight from Volvo's latest. But again, you get the massive Polestar logo front and centre on the wheel, and behind it, this fully glorious digital display that really is crisp and easy to see. Like many EVs coming to market, there's no start button. The seat switch knows when someone is sitting in the driver's seat, and if there's a key present, it'll let you drive. Phone as a key is on the way, but it's a little buggy right now. But what's interesting about the car is that the centre console here is running Android Automotive. No, not Android Auto, Android Automotive. It's like a little tablet permanently glued to your car. You can sign in with a Google account and it'll pull everything in from your Google settings, including your contacts and your favorites, your home address, and even your preferred music choice. Because it's Android Automotive rather than Android Auto, you also get a data plan with the car and you can download various Android Automotive apps direct to your vehicle. But there's no CarPlay integration for Apple users yet, which apparently is coming. The bonus of Android Automotive though, 
speech recognition, which frankly feels like the best I've seen in a car. You can ask the car to turn on the heated seats and the steering wheel, set the navigation or change the radio station, all using the voice button and Google's voice API. Meanwhile, on the back, there's again a feeling of being cocooned, not helped by the massive tunnel down the center of the car. That's a throwback to the fact the platform this car is built on is both a gasoline and electric platform. But Pulsar argues it lets it add extra batteries down the center of the vehicle, lowering the rear footwell a little. On paper, this is a five-seater, but seriously, I'd not want to travel with someone in between me and the other outboard seat. And if you've got a tall driver, be prepared to have your legroom eaten up by the seat. Still, I do have my own AC vents back here, and the view for the roof is pretty amazing. However, the problem I run into is this. I can't sit with my head perfectly straight because my temple brushes against the back of the C pillar here. I sort of have to keep my head cocked a little bit to the side. I'm about five foot eight and I have plenty of headroom this way, but this way? That's a weird place to not feel like I have enough space. One other thing I wanna mention, the takeaway hook, I guess Nikki would call it a curry hook, up in the front passenger area. It's hidden inside the glove box and can flip out to hold takeaway bag on the drive home so it doesn't spill on the floor. The glove box also has another great feature worth noting. Unlike most cars, the manual is just thrown in there. There's a tiny little illuminated shelf for the manual to sit on. That's cute, but if you want the actual latest manual, it's available right there in the touchscreen display. Style-wise, this is a really well-proportioned car. The wheels, while 22 on this model, with manually adjustable Olean's dampers, don't look massive. And while the CMA platform on which this is based on has plenty of crossovers built upon it, the Polestar 2 most certainly is not a crossover. There's a reasonably long bonnet and a sweeping front screen that flows into this panoramic glass roof, while the rear well, it's got the sweeping rear of an executive saloon of old, but Volvo prefers to call it a fastback. Which I guess I can see. Unlike most electric cars today, the Polestar 2 has its charging door at the rear of the vehicle where a petrol filler cap would be. And that's not a surprise since this is built on a platform that's intended for both petrol and electric drivetrains. Let's look at two more interesting features. The first is down here, a sticker that details the car's name, its battery capacity and its power. This is a 78 kilowatt hour battery pack and it has 300 kilowatts. Funnily enough, I learned last night that Polestar sends out updated badges to customers when there's an over the air update that unleashes extra performance or battery capacity. You just peel off the old sticker and throw on the new one. The other one that is worth noting are these mirrors. Unlike most cars where the glass moves within the mirror housing, the rear view auto dimming mirror is fixed and when you adjust the mirror, the whole housing moves too. Like every Volvo in the last few decades, the rear mirrors also tip down when reversing so you can more easily see behind you. I like that. Well, the bottom of the glass here may look like it's got a sedan truck waiting to pop up, you just do the pokey cokey with your foot and voila, a fully accessible tailgate. There's 405 litres, 14.3 cubic feet in the rear, or 1,095 litres, 38.6 cubic feet if you fold down the 60-40 split seats. There's also some nice touches back here if you're someone who wants to stop your stuff from falling around the rear. A cargo net at the sides, as well as a split load bay for stuff that you have to keep upright at all costs. At the front, there's a front trunk, but there's no easy release mechanism here. You've got to pull the front release cable by the driver's door pillar, just like you would a regular old hood pull, and then release the catch manually up front. When you get that open, you've got 35 liters, 1.2 cubic feet of storage, far less than the Tesla Model 3, Model Y, or the Mustang Mach-E, but it's large enough for a laptop bag or a small overnight case, your charging cables, as the case may be, and whatever else you can fit. And that's a lot more than the BMW i3 or Hyundai Ioniq 5 slash Kia V6 can offer. And with this car, the Charging cables you get are a full 40 amp EVSE, which as Kay Wall and Elliot pointed out, is a solid like $400 thing you would have to buy for yourself if you don't already have one. Although 
I'm interested to see just how many people are buying the Polestar 2 when it's actually their first EV and don't already have something like this. At the front of the car, you get probably the biggest hint that the Polestar 2 has Swedish blood pumping through its veins. The Thor's Hammer headlights, now well known from Volvo's cars, but on the Polestar 2, they've been streamlined a bit and swooped back some, and they give the car a really distinctive, and I think actually really elegant, subtly aggressive look. You also have this pretty expansive grille, which is, I don't know how to feel about it. To me, it really highlights that this is a cross-platformed car. This feels like the grille of an internal combustion car with some cladding slapped over it. But at the same time, it doesn't look bad. And it does serve a purpose. It helps bring in air for the car's active cooling system. Look above the grille and you've got the Polestar logo. Something that you'll see around the car more than the actual name Polestar. But our favorite one is the Polestar logo that's on the roof of the car. There's a little shelf inside the car just behind the rear view mirror that projects the Polestar logo onto the glass roof at night. Talking of lights, I've got to tell you about the little dance the Polestar's lights do at night. If you unlock the car with this very boring looking key, the lights do a little dance front and rear and it is legitimately really fun and makes me smile, which is good because the key doesn't. Finally got behind the wheel of a Polestar 2. We did, it, it took a while. I mean, to be fair, Polestar is a small company. Mm -hmm. As we said in the introduction, it kind of works like a startup, but it's owned by not one, but two legacy automakers, which is kind of interesting. And it went public through a SPAC, which is my least favorite way of entering the stock market. Yep. But the result is a car that undeniably feels like a Volvo, but a Volvo that's maybe not quite as boring as a, as a regular Volvo might be. And that's not to say that Volvos are boring, because I love Volvos. I love the fact that we've got reclaimed wood here. And I know it's a, you said it was a $5,000 option. Something like that, this interior, yeah. But it, it has a level of premium about it. When we, we drove last night to go pick up a, a takeout in it and my partner was very complimentary about the car and actually noticed that it was it felt a little bit more premium in some ways than say the Ford Mustang Marquis. Oh I totally agree with that. I think that the overall impact is very premium, dare I say even kind of luxury, especially with this interior. But then there are these there are these touch points where I feel like it falls down a little bit. The controls for the vents are very flimsy. The key is comically cheap and there's there are places where there are seams on the interior that I just don't think are as as clean as I want and the, the buttons on the steering wheel I don't love the feel of them but I'm I'm nitpicking what is honestly a very 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 nice interior I would say probably the nicest interior in EV that I've sat in other than Porsche one thing I absolutely love about this is this digital display oh, it's so good. Isn't it amazing? It is fantastic. Far better, dare I say it, than Tesla or Ford. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, I don't have an experience the new Tesla uh, front display. That is, it's so crisp, it's so clean, it conveys information really, really well, and it's honestly quite beautiful, and the binnacle is nice, deep set. I really like all of the information displays in this car. The center tablet is, is good, it's very responsive. I think its bezel is absurdly large. We joke about the Model 3 and the Mach-E feeling you've got an iPad glued to your dash. This really feels like you've got, you know, a Galaxy tablet or an iPad glued to I'm your dash. I'm glad that you said a Galaxy tablet because obviously it runs right. Android Automotive, not Android Operating System, not Android Auto. Android Automotive, which is basically a special baked-in automotive version of the Android OS. It's very restrictive in what you can do, but apparently you can watch videos. There's a video app that you can watch. I did download it I, the other night. I cannot tell you how little I care about that. You can watch that while you're charging. I can watch movies in my Tesla. You know how often I have? Like, once, <laughs> as a joke and it took like forever to load and stuff. The, the newer Teslas that have newer, the new Ryzen chips are faster about that, but yeah, I don't care about that. What I do care about is that the integration of this Android automotive with the car 
seems really good. So like we're navigating right now using Google Maps and it's telling us what our estimated state of charge will be at our destination. In a, you know, all that sort of integration is really, really nice and it is super responsive. I, I'm developing less and less of a tolerance for cars that are very touchscreen dependent and then have laggy, slow touchscreens. Um, and I, I kind of came into this expecting not to be super, super impressed by this thing's touchscreen. And I actually overall have, have been really pleased with the performance of the OS. Because of the customization of this car, you can actually change a whole lot about it. So you can change the creep mode. You can change the regenerative braking. And this is something that I think is going to really make it appeal to first time EV drivers. It is very Tesla-like in that way. I think it's one thing that Tesla has sort of set the standard for is that driver profile should include how tight do you want your steering wheel? What sort of regen do you want? What sort of acceleration do you want? And you very much have that in this car. It's also worth noting that when you one pedal drive this car, you can come to a complete stop without using the brake. The brake lights go on and the friction brakes are engaged. It is a, it is a true hold mode. You can one pedal drive this and never use the brake, which I, I really like. It is a little more aggressive on liftoff than I sometimes like. It feels almost like an i3 in that way. If you like fully lift off the pedal, I would get used to it super fast. I mean, I was getting used to it. I actually really like the throttle mapping and everything and the regen mapping on this car. I found this car very, very pleasant to sort of accelerate and brake with. We have 300 kilowatts at the wheels, 78 kilowatt hour battery pack, naught to 100 kilometers per hour, which is 62 miles per hour in about 4.7 seconds, which puts it right in the ballpark of uh, cars like the Mark E dual motor performance, or the premium as they call it. You know, it doesn't feel that to me. It feels quicker. The way that this is set up, it allows you to drive very naturally around town without fear that looking at the throttle wrong is going to somehow land you in trouble. Yeah. This feels like the, you know, the bottom half of the throttle is very well mapped, very gentle, very smooth. No jerkiness no at jerkiness all. No jerkiness at all, yeah. and it's very smooth. Even better, I think, the throttle response than it is on my Bolt, and I like the throttle response on my Bolt. What I feel like it emulates in a lot of ways is a turbocharged engine. Yes, because I can see that. You, when you're keeping the throttle in like the first half of the throttle uh, travel, it's gentle. I wouldn't say it's underpowered at all, but it's gentle, it's smooth, it's easy. And then once you pass a certain point, it's like the car says, okay, now you want oomph. I'm gonna give it to you and it will throw you back into your seat and it's very exciting and it's very, very fun. Which may make sense with Polestar's performance heritage. Absolutely. This is not a Tesla, so it doesn't have autopilot, but it has something very close functionally to autopilot. So you put your cruise control on and then you turn on your pilot assist here. It does some of the steering for you. I can lift my hands off the wheel for a short period of time. However, it would nag you if I did that long term my foot is off the throttle and it is just keeping me in the lane it's keeping me centered we tried this earlier on going around corners and i noticed that the system does a pretty good job of going around the corners for you there's nothing that seems particularly terrifying about its cornering <laughs> and interestingly the assistance system there was having difficulty because it went over a section of a bridge it didn't have clear lane markings mm. and the car was just weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving. That felt horrible. Um, I didn't get a ton of time with this. This didn't feel as secure to me in its lane centering as I find with Tesla Autopilot or Ford Blue Cruise. It's a nice workload reducer and the adaptive cruise control in this car I thought was really quite good. So we're heading back. We drove out to a, a mall about, what, 40, 50 miles out of side of Portland. Mm -hmm. We went there because it was about the limit of the car's state of charge. 
and we've been told that if you set a rapid charger as a destination, what the car will then do is it will preheat the battery. People had complained to you that the Polestar 2 doesn't charge very rapidly. Yeah, I had I had heard a number of people say that like, you know, 60, 70 kilowatts is what they were getting out of the Polestar 2. So I was really prepared to be disappointed. And I was not. We plugged in at around like 19, 20% state of charge. And at the very start, we were pulling down 145 kilowatts at a 150 kilowatt station. And then it, it quickly dropped off and settled to about like 135 and it held 135 for a decent amount of time. And by the time you, Kate and I were back from picking up food, the car was already at 75% state of charge. Like it charged up awfully quickly. And, and we actually really charged nice. up to like 85, 90% because we hadn't finished eating. Right, we sat and ate, but, and it, it did slow down of course, but even at like 80%, 83%, it was still pulling 55 kilowatts. And it didn't really, you know, drop off really precipitously until sort of not long before we unplugged. Um, that's the kind of charging performance that I personally would want to see in a car that I owned. One thing that I've noticed, and you've commented on it too, is that this car doesn't have the best visibility. Now at the front, I've got to say these A-pillars are actually quite small compared to a lot of electric cars that I've driven. Yeah, I'd agree with that actually. The A-pillars are not bad. Um, I think the, the roof line is a little bit low. The B pillars are pretty unpleasant. The C pillars are brutal. And the rear window, I believe I described it as Lamborghini-like in terms of how much <laughs> actual like real estate you can see through. It's very funny because of course the sloped windows, so it's a decent chunk of glass, but the actual like height of what you see through is very small. And this isn't an EV thing. This is a car thing. If you are putting a giant piece of glass over my head, I need a shade. Like, yeah, we're fine right now, but it's also 46 degrees in January in Oregon. If I was in Arizona in August, I think I might still want a shade, even though I understand the window is tinted and it's got some, you know, UV protection and the like, I still am gonna want some sort of shade or the, you know, automatically opacity thing that you get in the Porsche. Now, there are a couple of things that you really did like about this car. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about it because I don't own a Tesla. So the first one is it actually has proper door handles. On the inside and the outside, it has door handles. I like that this car has door handles. I like door handles. I don't like door poppers like you have on the Mach-E and like you're gonna have on the Cybertruck. I don't like the handles which are surfo handles that just actuate a servo the way you have in the Model 3. Like, this car has door handles and I really appreciate that. The other thing that I really like about this car is the seats are really comfortable. The seats are fantastic. You've it's got, got heated and ventilated front seats. The only thing I'll say about the seats is that I like a relatively high driving position and this seat doesn't go as high as I want it to. But they are fantastically comfortable and the seat heater could fry an egg at its maximum as could this heated steering wheel. The heated steering wheel has three stages of heat and I really like all three of them. The low is this really nice, just warm. The medium is sort of a good on a cold day and at maximum heat, it'll really warm up your hands if your hands are cold. I really, really liked that. So we like the feedback. We like the driving position of this car. We like the way that the car just is easy to drive as a car. We like the mm -hmm. throttle response. We like the braking action. We like the, the heated seats and the steering wheel because I mean, it's a Swedish influence there, yeah. I think. We like the chassis. I mean, we like the chassis dynamics in this car. I don't know how it would compare to one without the Olean stampers, but like overall, yeah, it's heavy and you th really throw it into a corner and it, I don't feel like it manages the weight as well as some cars, but it still manages it incredibly well. It's a very composed car. But would you buy it? That's a really good question. I did not expect when I got into this car that I would even for a moment contemplate that. If, if this car had 280 miles of range. And a lower price tag. And a lower price tag. I would be very, very, very tempted. Equipped as it is with this very nice high spec interior that this one is optioned with, I would even be, if I had the budget, I would even consider this a really incredibly strong contender at this price point. Personally, I think I would need more range out of it than, I, than I'm getting. And that 
I hate that, that I say that. My big, I think my biggest takeaway from this car is that if this is what Polestar can do with a shared platform that crosses both EV, plug-in hybrid, and petrol vehicles, I cannot wait to see what Polestar can do with a bespoke, ground-up EV. That's one of my, my big takeaways. My other big takeaway is that this is the first Chinese EV that I have driven. And if this is sort of a, a indicator of what Chinese EVs can be like, I'm really excited to see more of them come to our shores. So there you have it, the 2022 Polestar 2. Winter, did you have fun? I had a lot of fun. I liked this car actually a lot more than I expected to going in. It's, it's awfully cool and it makes me very excited to see what comes next. And thanks to Polestar Portland for letting us borrow the Polestar 2 for the few days that we needed it. And it thank really you fun. also to you all for watching at home. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our Discord chat room. There's a link in the video description. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transrevolve Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew. Go out to the folks on our right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Jason Bordor, Jade Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Guido Trajota, Brophy Wolf, Taslet in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burnis, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Laura Reynolds, Paul Conway, Ellery Hennersley, and Ian. If you are feeling left out, you can join Patreon at the link below, or you can show us your support through Bitcoin, Ko-fi, or our swag store. Thanks for joining us, and as always, keep, keep evolving! evolving.